Hey, what's up, 180 family? I'm Mark Schroer, and welcome to the 180 Drums Podcast. This is where we speak with some of the world's best drummers, and we talk about everything from career highlights, lessons they've learned, mistakes they've made, and some just hilarious stories from being on the road and being on stage. Before I introduce our guest today, I want to tell you guys about a promotion we have going on at 180 Drums. If you head over to 180drums.com, you can sign up for a free one-month trial and get access to hundreds of amazing drum lessons with the pros. You don't have to put in your credit card information. All you got to do is put in your email address and you can watch as many as you want and see what you think. Okay. On the podcast today, we have our good friend, Nathaniel Mila of Craviato Drums. He's going to talk about the history of Craviato Drums and how they've grown to become some of the most sought-after drums in the world. Well, with no further ado, please welcome Nathaniel Mila and Jake Nicole. Hey guys, welcome to the 180 Drums Podcast. Today we've got an incredibly special guest because we've got Nathaniel Mila on the show. This guy's with Craviato. Now, just before I let Nathaniel share a little bit, if you have not played a Craviato drum, one, I feel as sorry for you as I do that I feel li like I'm living <laughs> over here in Canada and this guy's in California, so I feel bad for you in that sense. And two, you need to hurry up and go try one because... These drums are remarkable, handcrafted, solid shell drums. Nathaniel, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, Jake. Appreciate it. So, dude, really quickly, uh, give us a bit of a background of Craviato, of you know Johnny Cravi. Just give us the give us the story, man. Man, where do you start? It's actually quite the tale. So, um, if we want to start with uh, the beginning here, Johnny Craviato was actually a professional drummer in the uh, the sixties, seventies, and into the eighties. And um, he was making it happen with everybody from like uh, Buffy St. Marie to to uh, Captain Beefheart. He played with Neil Young for a while in the 70s. Like he, he made the rounds. But uh, he was noticing throughout the 60s and 70s that he much preferred the drums from the 20s, 30s and 40s. Hmm. A lot of the a lot of the stuff that's become very desirable today amongst the, the vintage collectors um, at that point was still relatively accessible because it wasn't a vintage market yet. You know, the collector thing hadn't really picked up so he could get his hands on this stuff really easily. And he found that he preferred playing it. He, he dug the sound. He dug the feel. He dug the vibe. And uh, a lot of what made those drums special kind of kind of disappeared through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, as manufacturers were starting to focus on volume, thanks to the increase in number of kit players. You know, I mean, mm. Ringo happened and, and drumming, you know. No kidding. Be yeah, right? Yeah. Big so, time. yeah. So, uh, manufacturers started focusing on, on cranking out drums, which is great. We ended up with some, some really cool stuff, but it's a decidedly different vibe than a lot of the solid shell drums that used to happen in, again, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So Johnny realized that this art had kind of disappeared and starting in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, he decided to do what he could to sort of bring it back to life. And uh, Johnny was born and raised in, in the Santa Cruz, California area, which is a small coastal town, and uh, spent his time on the water and also around boats. And actually in the late 70s was working on boats where he learned how to steam bend wood. So, By the way, I just want to say real quick, that doesn't sound like an enjoyable area to live at all. It's horrible, let me tell you. It's just <laughs> just miserable. Working on but, boats, by the water, awful. Yeah, the sunshine, let me tell you. It's, it's oh, a rough you go. you jerk. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he's, he's learning how to steam bend wood, working on boats, and he's playing all these old school drums and decides that he wants to bring that that sort of old school, more traditional method of drum building back to life. How old would so, he have been at that time? Oh, man, that's a good question. He was born in, I think, 46. So at that time, you know, 35, 40. And he previously was not building drums but had experience. Like, you know, when did when did kind of the experience of using his hands to create something take place? Because I picture myself, you know, uh, a decade from now deciding, man, you know, I think I should be building drums. Like, I could, it would be so hard for me to be – the level that he has arrived at, you know? 
you know, he, he had the practical experience just from having played and toured. Um, I mean, that, that was a time where, where you didn't have the resources that you do today. Fair. Um, there wasn't the infrastructure that there is today to, to work on drums, to, to have people teching for you. Um, mm. So it was, it was a practical experience mixed with, um, he's, he's got a very curious nature and he has a, a tendency to sort of like, uh, sort of fixate on things. So if, if he becomes curious about something, if he takes an interest in something, he runs full speed ahead and gives it 110% and figuring it out and making it happen. And I think through having his hands on in the practical experience of touring, he took an interest in um, sort of the, the physical drum, taking an interest in uh, drum as an instrument, um, mm. not just in terms of playing, but in terms of teching. And he actually started doing odd jobs, uh, doing repair work on other people's drums I'd say, again, probably late 70s, early 80s. And locally, you actually see a lot of used drums on the market here that have this old school Johnny Craviato sticker inside of them. Come like an, a, a lot of, yeah, it's it's a trip because it's uh, it's the sticker he used to put in these drums that he used to work on. And um, he'd recut edges, he'd refinish drums, uh, outfit them with, with newer, quote unquote, better hardware. Hmm. Um, and you still see a lot of these drums kind of circulating around here. And uh, through doing that and then the steam bending, he kind of pulled all the pieces together and started making his own drums. At what point did he decide, was it from the get-go he decided, you know what, the way a drum should be made is solid shell, forget plies. Like, how did that come to be? Uh, that came to be through that uh, affinity for those vintage drums from the the 20s, 30s, and 40s, a lot of like the, the Slingerland stuff. Uh, Leedy was doing solid shell snare drums as well. I think Ludwig was at that point as well. Mm. I wish I personally was was better versed in what was happening back then. But uh, sure. those were the drums that inspired Johnny to uh, pursue that particular style of drum craft. Um, mm. Because by the 70s and 80s, all the major manufacturers had completely moved over to plywood shells. Wow. Interesting, so, man. Super definitely. fascinating. It's interesting to hear, even with Ringo, too. It makes you realize how much and anything that isn't popularized becomes popularized through culture. Like hearing about Ringo playing drums, oh, yeah. influx. I mean, even we did a podcast with Zildjian where Emily Smith talked about the same thing. And she was saying, you know, that point in history was huge for Zildjian as a company. Um, so it's very interesting to see that, you know. Totally. Well, I mean, that's that's when the trap kit uh, really became what it is we know today. I mean, right. you look at trap kits from you know dating back to the early 1900s, and they weren't quite what they are now. They they have definitely evolved, and it was, I think, really with a lot of jazz and rock and roll in the middle of the 1900s that it developed into the configuration that it is now. Fair, yeah, because you're right. So. Early 1900s, it didn't look like a drum set. Totally. I mean, there there were a lot of similar elements, but uh, they they had more of these like trap kits going on with different percussive devices, um, and then again, jazz and rock and roll happened, and uh, yeah, here we are, fifty, sixty, seventy years later, playing pretty much the same setups. So, wow, man, so cool. I mean, look look at the lasting impact that Ringo to this day has had on Ludwig, for example. No kidding. No I kidding. Mean, they, they are the biggest, you know, that is the name in drums. And it's still dating back to Ringo, Ed Sullivan. What was that? What, what year wow. was that? Like 64? Yeah, 60s for sure. So. Yeah. Wow, man. Well, it's, it's actually interesting. You know, in some ways, I'm probably ignorant to the scale then of Ludwig because, I don't know, I don't feel like the presence is as dominant in the market today as it has been in previous years. But... Uh, that's really interesting. Like you would, you would say Ludwig is one of the, uh, most popular drum manufacturers even today in terms of volume. Well, I, I don't necessarily know in terms of, uh, in terms of volume, in terms of what their sales may be, but no matter how you splice it, they're, they're kind of a household name. You know, sure, when, when people think drums, um, Ludwig is still kind of a go-to, um, because of, of that exposure, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, man. Okay, so so at this point, he's, you know, 
deciding that he's he's you know wants to be building drums because he's already working on drums. So what was like kind of the first the like when was Craviato born as a company the way it is today? Uh, the way it is today was 2004, but that was after about 10 years of Johnny Craviato making solid shell snare drums for DW. Right. So in in the mid 80s, uh, Johnny teamed up with Bill Gibson, who was actually the drummer for Huey Lewis in the News, cool. and they created the Solid Drum Company, Solid Percussion. Uh, that was short lived. Um, however, it kind of opened up the door uh, for Johnny because through Solid, um, I, th- I think it was actually Keltner who got his hands on a Solid drum, and Keltner presented it to the guys at DW. So Don Lombardi. Got you. And. Um, from there, Johnny hooked up with Don, and, and for 10 years, Johnny was making snare drum shells for DW. So I think that was about 93 through 2003, 2004. I had a drum for quite a while that had that uh, green badge, uh, the green Craviato badge on it, and yeah. the hybrid. And then, you know, since then, I've, I've went on to grab an Unlimited, which I think is one of the best drums for the price point. And then Thank you. this is funny, man. Here's a little backstory. This is one of the worst mistakes I ever made. Is I was in a phase of owning six and a halfs, and I had on a trade received a fourteen by five and a half bird's eye maple, and craviato, and <laughs> it wasn't the depth that I wanted. So Ooh. yeah, so I was like, man, I feel a little bit guilty having a drum that is this high end. And I really like the sound, but in my mind, I was thinking, man, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be owning this right now. I should probably put it up for sale. So put it up. And then this guy reached out to me and he said, man, would you want to trade for a six and a half Jara block? And I was like, oh, cool. I've always wanted a six and a half, <laughs> you know? So I, I meet up with this guy and that was actually Steve Augustine who became, you know, oh, my, nice. my co-founder in 180 drums. And, uh, so a Craviato was in the middle of that. And what's cool is that Craviato sits on the shelf at 180. And every every guest that comes, I'm like, dude, you see this drum? This is the drum that I regret trading, but it led, <laughs> <laughs> but it led to. I'm sure Steve would give it back if I uh, if I begged and pleaded. But um, I they, think I think we ha- all have those pieces, though. You know, we yeah. we as drummers, you know, we we want to experiment with different gear, play with different gear, and I think we all have those kits, those snares, those symbols that, you know, at one point in time may not have been right, but then in retrospect, you're just like. <sighs> crap why'd i let that go you know thank you for sharing that because yeah (laughs) at times i felt all alone but i think you're right man i I think we've all been there i mean i'm i'm thinking of one particular fibes kit that i had probably about 10 some odd years back that i really really wish that i still had it was an austin era 12 14 20 so it was the jasper shell and it was it was a tangerine sparkle wrap man i regret letting that thing go but such such is life yeah, such, such is life. life, man. Definitely, yep. such is life. As See, as yeah. as Johnny always says, it's uh, it's just another fish. You know, <laughs> John, Johnny's Johnny's big on fishing as well, and and whenever we have such conversations, he's always just you know just another fish. You got to remember that. That's great, man. That's well, a great perspective. Totally, totally. Just right. another drum. You know, there there will be more. Amazing. So, man, you know, right now. I have in front of me this list of names, and I want to quickly just kind of just kind of riddle these off because I think it's insane. Is you know Ronnie Venucci, Chris McHugh, Jason McGurr, Chad Cromwell, Bernie <laughs> Dressel. I mean, you got to, dude, you got to be kidding me. How did you guys acquire? What? When did the gospel of Craviato spread? You know, that's that's a good question. Um, Johnny created quite a name for himself doing those shells for DW. And a lot of drummers got their hands on those shells um, in in the 90s and early 2000s. And uh, word got out that he was doing kits. I think he started doing kits in like 2005, 2006. So solid shell kits. Um, and it just kind of spread like wildfire amongst the right people. Mm. Um, word got out and, and people wanted to give him a go. And um, as soon as we got more and more artists behind the kits more and more people got to talking about it and it just kind of happened. Uh, Johnny is not a headhunter. He, he isn't the guy that's going to be calling you up looking to get his drums, uh, on stage with you. You know, yeah, um, yeah, all yeah. these guys, all these guys have approached him. Um, mm. and I think that does stem from the fact that Johnny is doing something special and unique. 
Um, there's, there's not really anybody else out there doing what he's doing and how he's doing it. And the drums really do speak for themselves. I mean, every last one of these artists has elected to play these drums. Right. They, they make the conscious decision to play these drums. You know, a lot of these guys could go to any number of other companies and, and get stuff handed out. They come to us and, and, we're a small company. We can't afford to hand these things out. So they, they're making a conscious decision to buy these drums and play these drums. And I think that's testament to yes. these drums and to Johnny. Yes. Um, a lot of these guys too, I mean, obviously they enjoy playing the drums, but they also are sort of like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like proprietors of, of the art. You know, they have such a respect for what Johnny's doing as an art as well. So it just kind of happened. Um, word of mouth was really really it it's really cool man because uh you know i'm even thinking right now of famous marketers and the way marketers will talk about ideas spreading and how there's companies that you know so here's a really good example from lamborghini ferrari even maserati what you'll never see from any of those companies is a tv ad and the reason you'll never see a tv ad is because Lamborghini clients and Ferrari clients typically don't sit on the couch and watch TV because they're out doing running big businesses, right? Totally. And in a in a you know kind of in a comparison in the spirit of comparison, I think what I see with you guys is you're not out reaching out to a bunch of artists because you know that when you create something great, people come and knock on your door and you don't have to go and hunt down, you know, trying to give away stuff to get people to play it which is tough because you see a lot of small companies trying to survive, trying to look for endorse, endorsers instead of focusing on devel- developing a product that is impossible to ignore, which is, I think, totally. what Caraviato has done so well. You know? um, Thank you. Yeah, and, and only a handful of companies ever get to have that type of you know, longevity. Like, Look at how long Johnny spent time developing a name and a reputation and a consistency to what he did before it really caught fire. Well, and he's he's still developing that today. I mean, fact of the matter is, is these drums are are only getting better and better. Uh, they're becoming more consistent in terms of the production, and um, they. How do you best say? It's it's still a battle for him. I mean, there there are still a lot of drummers that are maybe familiar with the name. Maybe they know that that Venucci or McHugh or Cromwell or Bernie Dressel. These guys are playing these drums, but they're not necessarily versed in what's different about these drums, how, how they're constructed. And it's still very much so a process for Johnny and for this company to educate about what's going on here. Yeah. But yeah, and, and we do do a little bit of marketing, but I, I think much of the education needs to just be hands on, you know, um, these drums really do speak for themselves. And yeah. no amount, no, no amount of print ad or online presence will, will convey that. Hmm. Absolutely, so. man. I think you guys are going about it the right way. And I know that for myself, it's always tough for, you know, Nathaniel, let's be honest, guys like you and I, who are so embedded in the drum world, we kind of know mm-hmm. everything that's going on, but you're right. It's hard to gauge like how well is our impact doing how you know how many people are really familiar with what we're doing and how do we reach more people so i i would say pretty confidently that you guys are doing a great job and i think your social media is is strong which a lot of companies struggle with like you guys have 17,000 followers for uh you know a company that's building drums that's boutique it's you guys are doing a great job at reaching out and sharing the product and i love these new pictures that are your kits in front of unfinished shells. Just beautiful. <laughs> Whoever came up awesome. with that idea is a genius. You know, that that was that was totally, uh, I don't want to say a happy accident, but it's kind of just happened. So oh, I, used cool. to t- I used to take photos in the office here, but the lighting is horrendous. So it's just shadows cast everywhere, and you can never get the full effect. Mm. So I was trying to figure out, okay, how, ah. how do I get a picture of this kit without these horrible shadows and, and a horribly harsh light? And... I'm no photographer. However, I, you know, I use the camera on my iPhone and notice that, Hey, photos in daylight look good. Let's try taking a kit out in the daylight. So it just kind of so, happened. This was a moment of, well, I don't want to brag, but that was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's sure. That, that was my, I will take full responsibility for that great idea. 
Dude, very, 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 very humbly, very humbly taken responsible for that. Dude, I love it. I love <laughs> it, man. So yeah, yeah, that's that's super cool to know, man, because the definitely the word about Craviato is getting out there. I think the effort you guys are making is awesome. And, you know, I'm a geek, so I gotta be honest, like there's some of the most I mean, we talked at NAM and yeah immediately it was like dude you guys are making some of the most beautiful drums what do you personally own uh you know it's it's funny because i don't personally own a craviato kit cool um, this is that, this is always fascinating to me because i think of like the guys working to use the same comparison the guys working at lamborghini and ferrari don't probably drive a lamborghini or ferrari right totally i well i, I assume they don't yeah um I've I've got a Craviato kit set up here in the office, which I put to work whenever I can. So yeah. I I consider myself very lucky to have that as an option. Um, and if I bluntly, if I could afford a Craviato kit, I would in a heartbeat go yes. that direction. Um, but fact of the matter is, is even working here, they are expensive. Um, yes. And I see a lot of value in these drums, and I think they warrant that expense because I see what's going into them and the craftsmanship that goes into them. But uh, unfortunately, I can't necessarily afford them. Um, that said, uh, I'm not convinced that my plane warrants one of these kits. Anyways, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little ham-fisted. I'm a little heavy-handed. But dude, uh, that's all right, man. I know lots of great heavy-handed drummers. But like, uh, like you're saying, man. The other thing is, you know, there's a there's a degree of you're around these drums every day. Yeah. You are getting to still play these drums every day, almost totally. like why would you buy? <laughs> why would you buy one? Um, well, I'm I'm really privileged on that front, but I also want to stress that there is this uh, sort of notion in people's minds that these drums are kind of unattainable because of the price point, and I totally get it. But I want to stress that for as many of these big name guys as we have buying these kits. I interact with a lot of working drummers on a regular basis who see value in what they do and they pinch their pennies and they save up and they make one of these kits happen because they, they understand and have an appreciation for the construction, the sound, the vibe, the feel. I mean, these drums don't play like anything else out there, you know? Yeah. Yep. So. Absolutely. And you guys have also built some pretty innovative products. So, you know, I'm looking at a picture where it, I'm assuming this is like around an 18 or 20 inch snare drum. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I think what I in think, the world? Talk me through that. <laughs> I think that kind of started out as a joke between uh, Johnny Craviato and uh, one of our former artists, Matt Chamberlain. Um, I'm not sure the full story, but I, I think it was sort of presented as a challenge of sorts and Johnny isn't really one to back down from a challenge. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, Johnny, I challenge you to build me a drum set for free. I don't think you could do it. That's awesome, yeah, that, man. That, that, that might be a bit of a battle he may or may not be able to conquer. So. No kidding. He's like, you win, dude. You're, you totally win on that one. You, you, you may have just won. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, that's, that's super cool, man. I think it's cool to see – that you guys, it seems like you you have a high level of, the highest level of excellence in what you do, but yet you're having fun. And I think Definitely. more companies need to be doing that, you know? You know, we, we the, the entire company is seven people. Um, wow. There are, yeah, there are six of us here in production. And we do take a lot of pride in what we do. Um, and we also recognize that, that people have high expectations of this product and rightfully so. And we want to not just meet, but exceed those expectations. You know, people wait six to eight months, sometimes even longer for some of these kits. Hmm. We want that wait to be well worth your while and then some. Yeah. And, and we're conscious of that as we make these drums, but we're also, we're, we're kind of of the mind that we should just be doing the best we can, no matter how you splice it. We, we want to make a quality product. We want to make a product that drummers are inspired to play, that they're proud to play. And I, I, I feel that we're, we're giving them that. Yeah, big time, man. Um, how many drum kits are you guys putting out every year? That's a good question. You know, we, we just completed building kit number 750. That's only 750 kits we've built to date. Wow. Um, I'd say realistically we do probably about 100, 110 kits a year. 
I was going to say you built 750 and at least 1% of them are owned by Ronnie Venucci. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's, I think it's actually more than 1% at this point. Um, <laughs> how many kits does he have? What's the scoop there? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I'd actually have to get with him on that. Um, I could wow. probably count, I could probably count at least 15 or 20 somewhere in there. Get out of here. You no, know, Ronnie, Ronnie has an absolute, he's not just an incredible drummer, but he also has an incredible ear. And he is an incredible friend of the company. I mean, yes. he he has been so so good to us in terms of of uh, getting people aware of of us and what we do. And um, there's nothing we can ever do to repay him on that front. I mean, Amazing. that's that's been invaluable. And um, you know, he 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 wants one of every flavor. You know, he he wants every different wood species, you know, it's, it's interesting to him. It's fun to him. And he has such an ear that he, he appreciates those different flavors, you know? Yes. So incredible drummer and and just such a kind dude through and through. So he seems like such a great guy, man. Yeah, yeah. definitely. He's, he's one of the nicest dudes you could ask to know. Now, man, what are some of the things that you're most excited about for the company moving forward? Walk me through that a little bit. You know, Moving forward, I think it's it's important for us to just do what we do and do it to the best of our ability. Yeah. Um, we we at the end of the day we have one product and that's a solid shell drum. You know there there are other things that sort of supplementary things here and there like the collaborations we do with Adrian Kirschler on a semi annual basis. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a solid shell drum that differentiates us from everybody else in the industry. Now talk about and, the cl- talk about the collaboration for a minute because that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, th- there was a drum show in Europe. I, I honestly don't specifically remember where um, that Johnny was introduced to Adrian Kirschler by a mutual friend. And at the time, I believe Adrian was just starting out in building these metal shells. And Adrian had built a sort of black, uh, like a Ludwig Black Beauty style drum um, that he he. Sh- I don't know if he presented it to Johnny or, or got to talking about it with Johnny, but they, uh, they crossed paths and uh, got to talking about doing a collaboration because Johnny had such an appreciation for what Adrian was bringing back to life with that, cool. that Black Beauty style shell. Um, sorry, that phone That's good, man. People, people are buying kits. Yeah, right. But that's a cool relationship, man. It's cool to hear how that kind of spanned out and connected. Yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. As the, uh, I, had the phone you, was I had you, I had you <laughs> my, back, my man. My bad. But uh, no, so they uh, they they got to talking drums, and, and Johnny got his hands on an AK shell, and and it's it's very true to what Ludwig was doing in the twenties, which, as I discussed earlier, is something that Johnny has always been a fan of. And uh, Adrian very much so is the metal shell equivalent of what Johnny does. Hmm. You know that that sort of old world hands-on craftsmanship. I think what's cool, man, is like, you know, I love the fact that there's uh, such a respect from master to master. That's really cool, you know? Oh, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. There's no lack of love between not just this company and Adrian, but boutique brands on the whole. I mean, we all get together at NAM every year, and, and, you know, it's great to see people and catch up. But also, we're all drum geeks at the end of the day. We're, we're here because it's a labor of love. Yes. You know, we're, we're here because we want to be doing this. And so it's, it's great as drum geeks to be able to sit down and, and geek out on each other's gear. And yeah, there is a mutual respect that comes from that, no matter how you splice it. Absolutely, so. man. And uh, let me just say, one of the drums as well that we use frequently at 180 that I think is a standalone is the, uh, the 14 by 8 brass. I believe it's the... Uh, it's got the the silver badge, the AK, AK yeah. brass. That totally. is, dude, that is just such a beautiful drum. So like, you know, just to encourage you guys to go and check out the fact that you guys are not only using solid shell for wood, but your brass, you, you know, your hybrid copper, um, the, the black nickel master's brass. So you guys have some crazy drums that well, all, are, yeah. All of those were collaborations with Adrian Kirschler. There you go. Um, and, and this year, actually, we introduced a, a bronze drum that was, again, a collaboration Ooh. with Adrian Kirschler. We're doing, uh, we're doing 25 of the 5 and a quarter by 14 and 75 of the 7 by 14. So those, those are making their way out there right now onto uh, drum shop shelves. 
Oh, that's so, super exciting, man. What would you say is yeah. the drum that's been the most in demand or the, uh, you know, the wood type that gets the most asked for? Uh, the six and a half by 14 maple snare drum by a mile. Cool. Uh, ev- everybody's familiar with maple at this point. Maple has kind of become an industry standard. People kind of know what they're getting into with it. But even beyond that, it's it's become a standard for a reason. It's a very versatile wood. It's a very capable wood. And um, that six and a half depth is sort of the go-to for a lot of people. I mean, just as you were discussing earlier with that that five and a half when you wanted a six and a half, you know, that 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 one that got away. It's funny because, you know, the thing that I actually regret, and this is going to sound, just so everyone knows listening, I pick companies that I personally enjoy to reach out to. That doesn't mean that if if someone hasn't been on the podcast, I don't like them. It's it's totally not that at all. It's it's that, you know, we connected with you guys because I went out of my way to go over at NAM and say, you guys are making something awesome. So, you know, that's all to say that the five and a half, what was amazing about that drum that mm. I immediately regret is that it was so versatile. And now that I've had all this time, because I still get to play it all the time, so it's not a real loss. Um, <laughs> I can still bore it. It's essentially still a drum that exists in my world. And we've used that so many times at 180 with guests in. So you guys can check that out with Marcus Finney's lessons. You can hear that drum quite a bit. And the thing that I miss a lot, and that uh, that you that you miss in other drums that are five and a halfs, is it still has the ability to have the depth. Uh, you know, you can still get a, a great full body, low tonality sound out of it that you can't get out of a lot of other five and a halfs. And I, I mean, that must be somewhat attributed to the solid shell for sure. I was going to say exactly that. I, I think that's the beauty of the solid shell, and one of the things that makes these drums so unique. Uh, I actually personally favor the five and a half by 14 maple, whereas pretty much any other snare drum, I'm always into deeper drums, but this five and a half 14 maple does have an incredible range to it. It does have one of the widest tuning ranges I've ever come across on a snare drum. You can tune that thing down super low and fat and it takes it like a champ. You can crank it up and it's, it's just got attack for days. Hmm. It, it is, I, I feel that particular drum, the five and a half by 14 maple it is whatever you throw at it. Very cool. Yeah, so. I would I would totally agree, man. I think I maybe it's just because I have enough six and a halves. But I think for everyone that's going through the six and a half phase, the reason you want to try a five and a half Craviato if you're looking to to go down the road is because you you're gonna also get that really tight, solid, thin sound that you might want as well. And by thin, I mean. Um, very direct, very almost like you you can also get rid of some of the body, which in a six and a half, it, that almost starts to get a little bit hard to do, right? Um, totally. It's hard to make a deep drum sound shallow, you know? Totally. So Where, Whereas this five and a half, you can make sound pretty deep. Pretty deep, man. And so. that's that's the same thing that really surprised me, you know, on the contrary, about the uh, eight by 14 brass the ak brass is that that drum that drum also has like the full bag of tricks where you can just accomplish everything with that drum man it's so versatile and and that's testament to adrian i mean adrian is an incredible craftsman and there is a reason every last one of our artists plays his drums as well i mean Hmm. pretty much every one of our artists also has has an adrian kirschler craviato collaboration for a reason I mean, as far as metal shells go, they are the metal shell equivalent of what we're doing here at Craviato otherwise. Very cool, man. I mean, and Adrian's a great dude through and through, but above and beyond that, just his craftsmanship, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I've been working with these drums for for a number of years now, and every time I see one of his shells, I just sit there and think, how does he do this? And then I hear it. What do you notice? Like from your perspective, having all this experience, what do you notice the most? Well, he, he is quite literally one dude in a garage making these shells ha- by hand. It is wow. it is him and his pair of hands, and that is it. And to think that somebody can take a sheet of metal and turn it into one of these shells by hand is pretty incredible. And again, I haven't necessarily wrapped my head around yet. It's a mystery to me how he does it. I get my hands on these shells, and I'm just like, man, that is it's beautiful. Hmm. Uh, the craftsmanship is is second to none. And uh, this copper is it the one that I'm seeing that has the brushed looking finish? 
The copper has the brush looking finish. Dude. Correct. Oh my goodness. That looks amazing. I that, feel that like that was a super dark, dry drum. That was a cool drum. Oh, very cool. And the copper that you're putting out now that you said is about to go out, what separates it? What's different about it? Sorry, this this drum this year is a bronze drum. My apologies if I said copper. Bronze. No, I think you did say bronze. I think okay. I'm just bewildered by the look of this with this brushed <laughs> the brushed look. It's it's funny because in a lot of ways I feel like uh, you know, Joyful Noise was maybe one of the first companies to be trying to produce and you can you can absolutely correct me because I'm speaking in complete ignorance, but um, one of the companies that went out after the the bronze thing, or sorry, the metal high end snare drum shells, and you know these drums, uh, you know, have such a unique personality to them here because that brass, I can't talk enough about it, man. I'm such a geek, but <laughs> you guys are making phenomenal, you know, uh, metal shells now too. So so cool. Well, glad you're enjoying it and putting it to work. As far as the uh, joyful noise thing goes, I honestly don't know enough about uh, their origins. Um, yeah. I know Kurt. Kurt's great people through and through. Um, and it's always a joy seeing his drums. Yes. I, I don't know enough of the story as far as, as how that all came together, quite bluntly. Very cool. Yeah, so. we've, got, we've got one of those in the, in, the, in the studio as well. What made me think of it is they really go for a rustic, beat-up kind of look. And um, there's some of that in this Copper Masters shell that I'm seeing. But uh, again, man, just different approaches. Like I love, I love everything about that drum. You guys need to go check that out. In order to find it, you could just search Craviato AK Copper Masters Metal Series and you'll come across it for sure. Um, beautiful. I love the simplicity of the throw-off too, which is quite different than the typical trick. You know, that, that throw-off is a uh, sort of a throwback to... Um, the three-point throw-offs they used to do back in the early mid 1900s, those throw-offs are made one at a time by hand by wow. Adrian Kirschler. Yeah, Get out are, of here. Yeah, it's completely handmade. I don't know. Again, I don't know how he does it. The guy's a miracle worker. Wow. In fact, I've I've got one in my hand right now that I'm looking at, and I'm just like, how how do you do this? <laughs> so, so, somehow or other, he he has found a way. Wow. But uh, one of the cool things about that copper drum too is that it's a completely raw natural finish so brand new yes they have that brushed copper look but with the raw finish in time it will patina depending on how it's handled so it over time it will tell the story of the owner of the drum you know if it's a drum that was really put to work and played and played out it's going to show no matter how you splice it if it was just sitting on a shelf you can tell it was just sitting on a shelf and i think that's one of the cooler things about um, the the raw brass and raw copper that Adrian does, and he had that in mind when putting these shells together. He he wanted it to tell the story of the drummer. You know, um, it's it, it really does indicate how the drum was put to work. Hmm. You know, I mean these these drums are are the tools of our our trade. You know, as as cliche as that may sound, um, and it really is cool when you see some of these drums that have some miles on them. Um, just the extent to which they show how they've been played, you know, um, like a lot of these rock guys, you know, they're sweating all over it. They're spitting on it. They're bleeding on it. And the drum shows <laughs> that, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of these sort of like more, more gentle sort of, uh, uh I don't, I don't want to necessarily typecast, but a lot of like the, the jazz drummers that are taking it a little bit easier. Sure. You yeah, know, that's fair. You know? That's fair. It, it adds up, man. It, it totally adds up and it's really cool to see over time. Well, I think the truth is when you say that, the reason it's accurate is because although jazz drummers can be heavy-handed when necessary, the frequency at which they're heavy-handed does not compare to a rock guy. It just it can't or it's no longer jazz. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it's frequency well, for sure. Although where where does that line get drawn? I mean, it is still kind of kind of jazz. What I'm thinking of here is like uh, one of my favorite drummers ever growing up was uh, – Jimmy Chamberlain of the Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, yeah. And and he is very much so a jazz drummer. And you can tell, even in his rock licks, that he is a jazz drummer through and through. And it's weird because it's rock music, but it's still kind of jazz drumming. Where does that line get drawn? Is it not jazz drumming because he's playing it in a rock setting? Right. Interesting. Great. So, yeah, it's a great point, know. man. There's, I find some of the best... Some of the guys that have the best feel have that jazz sensibility brought into the wa- the rock world. Most certainly, best touch. You know, it's uh, totally. 
I'm right there with you, man. I definitely agree. Totally. And then we've got a couple of our artists like uh, like um, Justin Brown or uh, or Marcus Gilmore. Those guys, they they've got the chops. They got the jazz thing going on, but they can rock out like nobody's business, even when they're laying into a jazz gig. I mean, they they can bring it. They they can bring that presence, that energy that you necessarily associate that you don't necessarily associate with jazz that you more associate with rock and roll. They can bring it to jazz, you know? Yeah. So it's weird. Where, how do you draw that line or do we even need to draw that line? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say, I'd say we probably, I don't know. It's, it's interesting, man. I think it's good to analyze guys and understand the background of where, how they're approaching the drums and the thought process behind it for sure, man. Um, Bonham's a classic example when you look at Bonham's inspiration and how far away his inspiration is from the sound that he kind of ended up creating it's uh, pretty fascinating man and and there's probably not another drummer out there that's created such a uh, definitively personal innovative sound so so readily identifiable sound wow, um, as yeah. far as as far as the general public is going to be concerned yeah I would agree man you know there's a few people that that you know you could maybe draw somewhat of a comparison to but it's it's few and far between like maybe steve jordan you know i'd totally. say he's probably one other guy that off the top of my head has such like up like i like the way you said publicly identifiable sound to well, you know uh to put it you know to uh in layman's terms right um well there's a set of difference between what you and i notice as drummers and and identifying say steve jordan's sound and what my you know what my mother may be able to identify you know yeah, my yeah. my mom can sit down and hear bonham and go oh hey that's bonham right you know? dude so true man so. yeah very true very cool yeah you're right because there's lots of guys that have sounds even steve jordan is someone that maybe is more in just within the drumming community it's it's sacrilegious not to know who he is but yeah to the public would they be able to identify that it's it's totally. it's yeah it's history man john bonham has a sound of history in what he does so and, and people have been trying to emulate it ever since. Yes, absolutely. Some of the guys that, that, you know, I say this enough on the podcast, but there's dudes like Elon Rubin out there who have done such a great job at emulating that sound, you know? Totally. It's pretty amazing. That, but, that guy's uh, a monster player. He such is, a monster player. Uh, such a jerk. So ridiculous. <laughs> so ridiculous. Man, and so, it, it, it's, it's almost worse, too, because he's such a nice guy. Oh. He's such a nice, he's such a nice guy and such an incredible player. It's like, man, you've got it all. Dude, you're soft, <laughs> soft-spoken. He's like dating a model. What a jerk, eh? Yeah, right? What a jerk. Seriously. Um, man, so who, who, uh, who are some of the guys that inspired you the most or you know, maybe even some of the artists on your roster that you really enjoy listening to the most as drummers, whether it's you know bands or – Drummers specifically, you know, as far as the the guys that that have inspired me the most, I already mentioned Jimmy Chamberlain and the Smashing Pumpkins. I, I think he's a phenomenal drummer through and through. Um, and then there are a lot of kind of uh, he, he's got to be the most technical guy that I'm yeah. I'm particularly a fan of. But a lot of the drummers that I grew up listening to that particularly inspired my playing are not technical drummers at all. In fact, they're the guy that are total meat and potato types that just like they get done what is appropriate for the song. I have such a respect for guys that can sit down behind a kit and play to the song, you know? Right. Um, so guys like, uh, like Roy Berry, who is the drummer for a band out of Memphis, Tennessee called Lucero. Um, cool. He, he's just got such a craft to his playing. It's so tasteful and it sits so well within the structure of these songs. Um, there's a guy named uh, Tyson. Uh, I'm spacing on his last name, but he's the drummer for a band out of San Francisco t- uh, called Two Galants. Cool. Just a crafty drummer through and through, but not necessarily a technical drummer, you know? Yeah. Um, he just writes very well to the song. Um, as far as our roster, I mean, of course, Ronnie is such a powerhouse player, and he's he's rad to watch play. Um, one of the guys on our roster that's, that's kind of understated is uh, Chris Tyrell, who plays with Lady Antebellum. Um, yes. there, there's an energy about that guy's playing and he does such a beautiful job of sticking to the pocket and he kind of goes unnoticed. He's kind of under the radar, but, uh, you'll never see that guy behind a kit without just the biggest gnarliest smile on his face. Oh, so and, cool. Yeah, totally. I have such an appreciation for those drummers that are making it happen like that. You know, yeah. the guys that are stoked to be there stoked to be playing to the part you know stoked to 
make it happen. Those are the drummers that I, I especially uh, respect and admire. Um, yeah, uh, Bernie Dressel is an absolute joy to watch. He's he's a really oh, crafty Bernie's player great, too, man. And it's great too because he's not just a musical player, but like he's not just a technical player. He's a very creative player. So the way he brings that technicality to a song is very tasteful. Absolutely, man. He's uh yeah, he's another guy who just has such a such a great sound, such great feel. Even going back to guys that are always smiling. I mean, Brian Blade is someone that always comes to mind. That guy has Definitely. always got a big smile on his face. Um super cool, man. Yeah, Chris Tyrell, you're right. He is a fantastic drummer, and I think the best drummers are the ones that actually go unnoticed. That means they're doing a really great job, you know? Totally. Totally not not overplaying a part, you know, they're they're doing what they got to get done and doing it right. You know, I really dig that. Yeah. Plus, like, plus guys that bring a right vibe to the game, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. Coming with, uh, exactly what's needed for the artist they're representing is huge. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's why a lot of the artists on our roster have been so successful because they, they do exactly that. You know, I mean, think of like uh, Jason McGurr of death cab for cutie. Um, oh, he dude. is so so good at finding and locking into a groove with those guys in Death Cab. But man, he is such an incredible player above and beyond that. I mean, he has some incredible hands on him. He can chop it up if he wants to, but he's he's not going to, you know? He gets it. He is actually I think he's he's got to be one of the most technically proficient pop drum players there is where he's like you know, playing at 5% of what he knows, if not less, like 1% of what he knows. Um, it's crazy how much a guy like Jason McGurr can sit there and be like, I'm going to play this on my feet and break down this, you know, just oh, wild. Yeah. And it's great too, because every time I catch him play, I feel like there are other things about his playing that I notice. Like you, you can delve so deep into what he does. I mean, it, you can take it at, at surface level and just acknowledge the fact that it works really well with Death Cab. Or you can dig as deep as you want to dig. I mean, he he has crafted some gnarly grooves. Yeah, I could not agree more, man. Definitely. Yeah, you're right. He's take he's taken his his technical know how and applied it in a really uh, really foundational way to what they do, and yet created super innovative parts as well. For sure. Totally. Totally. Awesome. And that's that's huge. That's huge. Man, if you would you know kind of give me one perspective on, or I guess kind of the the over over what am i trying to say here i'd say like kind of the the big scope picture what is craviota trying to say as a drum company what are we trying to say um that's a good question that's a thought of that is that is the ultimate like Um, like jake dude why are you asking me that live bro (laughs) (laughs) yeah right catching me off guard why didn't you prep me with that one dude what you what you trying to do to me that's Um, right I, I wish I had some canned response I could just give you, you know, something I could just copy paste and, uh, no, um, what, <laughs> what is, what is Johnny trying to do? I mean, convey, uh, man, deep thoughts, deep thoughts for a Friday afternoon. Yeah, that's right, um, dude. That's right. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I, I think what ultimately shines about these, these drums and, um, by extension of that, what, uh, what is being conveyed here is that, um, there's, there's so much more to be said for the human element of this than anything. There is a vibe about these drums, about Johnny, about the artists we work with, about the guys that play these drums. Um, there has to be a certain understanding and appreciation for the human element behind these drums. And, where we're taking that, I, I I'm not sure that we're necessarily taking it anywhere in particular so much as as just hoping to get them into the right hands of the people that that truly enjoy sitting down behind it and playing them. You know, yeah. Um, like I was I was talking about uh, Chris Tyrell and the smile on his face the entire time he's playing that kit. I think that's what all of this should really boil down to is it, it's it's supposed to be fun. And it, it, it's, it's supposed to be a joy to sit down behind your kit and play. And, um, it's hard not to have fun and, and be stoked when you're sitting down behind a Craviato kit between the sounds it's emitting underneath your stick and, and the way it plays. 
um, they're they're a really inspiring instrument to sit behind. Um, and time. and I've, yeah. I've had a lot of I've had a lot of drummers uh, say exactly that that they sit down behind their Craviato kit, and it inspires them to play in ways that they may not otherwise play. You know, it inspires them to get uh, more crafty, more creative. It inspires them to to get more technical, um, to to venture different directions into drumming that they may not have otherwise ventured into. Um, I, I think, think that's I, I think that's the best thing, man, is that it, it inspires creativity and it's allowing people to venture into areas they wouldn't usually venture into. I think that's wonderfully said, man. Thank you. And uh, I, I, I think that Johnny no, I, I know that Johnny is doing this as as a labor of love. It's something he he genuinely wanted to do and he's doing it. And I think that translates through the instrument. Yeah. Um and there, there is a hands-on human element about these drums. You can tell that that some dude poured his heart and soul, his his life into creating this, and uh, it's really inspiring to sit behind. And I would agree, man, yeah. big time. Yeah, I think I think it's usually a sound that inspires something the most, man. It's hearing something in a drum that inspires you to go deeper and to create something with that sound, you know. Totally. Keep digging a little deeper into it, you know, see what you can pull out of it. Well, man, this has been awesome, dude. It's already been almost an hour that we've been on this call. <laughs> so let, let's, uh, you know, let me let you get back to work. And in the meantime, just, just thanks for your time, dude. We appreciate it so much here at 180 Drums. And obviously we're focusing on building a platform that's education. And I think the best part of education is getting on the inside of, you know, of seeing what companies are up to and understanding the vision that they have and the passion that they have for what they're building, whether that's, you know, education or whether it's drums specifically. So you guys are doing amazing work. You've been such a great guest, man, taking us back all the way to the twenties. I think we got back to the twenties <laughs> with stuff. So Nathaniel, thank you, my man. Well, thank you for having us. It was huge of you. And, and thank you for doing what you do. I mean, what you guys do is, is a huge asset to the drumming community and, and it's invaluable to have have resources like you, like what what you're doing, um, to not just the guys coming up, but even the guys that have been at it for quite some time. You know, it's it's cool to to have those educational tools, those different perspectives, these these talks. You know, I agree, so. man. I, I really hope that for all you guys listening, you took a lot away. And that uh, you go out of your way to, you know, look up a bunch of Craviato. I think some tutorials will be in our future for sure to highlight more of the gear and uh, allow you guys to see inside just how amazing these drums can sound. So, dude, it's been a pleasure. We'll have to have you As back well. on at some point and uh, dive even deeper, man. Sounds good. Definitely, uh, definitely keep in touch. We'd be uh, more than happy to keep talking. I could talk drums all day, man. Dude, <laughs> likewise, man. It's we'll chat with awesome. you soon, Nathan. Sounds good. Hey, thanks for having us. There you go, the gospel of Craviato drums. If you haven't tried a Craviato, go find somewhere where you can try one, try a snare drum, try a kit. Um, they are astounding. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. Definitely go check out the show notes. Head over to 180drums.com forward slash Nathaniel M. We're going to have some pictures of some really cool Craviato kits up there along with some key points that Nathaniel was talking about on the podcast today. If you enjoyed this podcast, definitely go rate us, tell a friend, and tune in again next week. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your week. And most importantly, go have some fun and hit your drums.